Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin with the Mises Institute. And Tho Bishop is on vacation. So with me this week is Zachary Yost, our foreign policy guy. And it happens to be foreign policy week anyway. So the two of us will discuss what is going on with Trump, his upcoming foreign policy, the escalation in Ukraine, and will anything really change uh, once Trump is in office? Uh, you know, something that Lou Rockwell once said to me was, the regime lies about everything all the time, but they lie even more about foreign policy. And I think that's probably very, very true, is that it's just next to impossible to get reliable information or to really know where any sort of candidate or president is headed on the foreign policy issue, certainly ahead of time. You basically have to just wait and see what they do. And even then, you don't know what their motivations are. So we're just uh, we're peering through a fog here, trying to, trying to figure out what the story is with foreign policy. Before we do that, I just want to make sure that if you haven't seen it yet, be sure and check out our uh, documentary on the Federal Reserve. This is called The Federal Reserve Playing With Fire. And you can find that at uh, Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G slash fire. And this has all of our top guys, right? Salerno, uh, Alex Pollock, Mark Thornton, Jonathan Newman, all offering their insights on the Fed with some basic explanation about the Fed as well. It's a beginner video, but even if you've been following the Mises Institute for a while, you might find some good nuggets in there, especially how our experts phrase the realities of how the Fed works. So be sure and check that out. If you haven't seen it yet, that's um, M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G slash fire. That's our new Federal Reserve documentary. So on the foreign policy issue, Zach, uh, so Trump won. Great. I mean, I always wonder how much foreign policy even really f factors in to an election. I mean, plenty of people tell you, oh, it was inflation, which, uh, yeah, economic conditions, I think, were a major factor. Uh, and there was a l plenty of other domestic issues as well. I don't know in the average calculus of of the voters. And of course, it depends on which voter you talk to <laughs> as to how much uh, foreign policy was a factor. Now, a lot of people, I think, maybe would admit that seeing hundreds of billions of dollars go to Ukraine while people are having trouble paying for groceries probably wasn't, wasn't great. But I noticed that the money given handed over to the state of Israel is nev was never discussed during the election. There were never any calls to end foreign aid to that country, just to Ukraine. So obviously there wasn't a general sentiment against foreign aid or foreign intervention here, just, I guess, in Ukraine. Uh, and on the issue of China, too, there didn't seem to be much problem with people voting for Trump. Uh, given his belligerence toward China and efforts to start a trade war and a variety of, of other pieces of tough talk toward Beijing. So I don't, I, my personal opinion is I don't think we can say in any way this is some sort of anti-interventionist election uh, and that there was any sort of mandate coming for the Trump administration to bring all the troops home, uh, although I'm sure many of the voters would be fine with that. Uh, so I'm not holding my breath for major changes in foreign policy, but I wanted to get your sense of that. I mean, <laughs> as we've discussed in the past, right, I mean, foreign policy is what always seems to change the least when, when administrations come and go. Uh, and there are reasons for that that we can discuss. But what's your take on, on the Trump victory? And, and uh, I don't know, on a scale of 1 to 10, what number would you assign to the amount that things are going to change uh, with the new administration coming in? Yes. So uh, I think you're correct on the role foreign policy played. Most people were concerned with domestic issues, I would say. However... Uh, there, I have seen some polling that, in general, people did support a less interventionist stance. As, as you note, with Israel, there is differing views on that, though. I do think Ukraine is sort of the poster child for people thinking 
you know, our foreign policy is off the rails. I mean, people are like, oh my goodness, World War III could happen. And also, yeah, just the pouring gajillions of dollars into this war. Uh, so there were some people who were very motivated by foreign policy, and this is where it's going to be interesting to see how Trump, Trumpian governance actually plays out, because <laughs> He made huge inroads among Arab and Muslim Americans and also among Jewish Americans. So that's, I mean, maybe he can cut a good deal, as it were. Uh, there was a piece in the American Conservative a few weeks before the election that said that basically the word is that Israeli governing officials were a little bit worried that Trump would win, actually, <laughs> and for to force them to conclude the situation. Uh, I don't know if that'll make anyone happy or maybe just one side or the other, but that's something that's out there. Uh, one to ten of how much things will change, I really, I can't say at this point. I do know that there are some encouraging signs. I mean, to me, it's I'm a bit optimistic, I would say, with relatively small <laughs> goals in terms of what, what makes good progress. About 10 years ago now, or uh, nine years ago, I guess, when I worked in D.C. in foreign policy, the current situation was really unimaginable. Uh, in terms of what was acceptable to be said and what was considered kooky nonsense. Um, specifically just addressing foreign policy, J.D. Vance's comments, I find very good. Well, before find... you go on, give me some examples of when you were in D.C., like what, what was considered kooky nonsense and what was considered just standard run-of-the-mill stuff. Oh, I mean... All of our, basically everything on this show was out there. I mean, just sure. for a good, great example is NATO. Uh, I mean, one of the first pieces I ever wrote that got published in sort of a mainstream thing, I wrote for the National Interest, and I think they called it, NATO doesn't need Montenegro's teeny tiny military, uh, where I pointed out this is ridiculous. The New York City Police Department is like 15 times bigger than Montenegro's armed forces. How does this, you know, support American security in any way? And it was a tiny minority view that either was ridiculed or just scoffed at. Uh, I mean, all of our work on basically saying, oh, leaving Afghanistan, that was heretical. Uh, I mean, the, the arguments about why the situation in Ukraine and Georgia was closer in history then, but, you know, arguing that NATO intervention or NATO expansion contributed to the situation. There was, I think his name was Josh Schifrensen. Can't remember where he is now, but he had a, an article come out, I think in um, uh, International Security, maybe I forget the journal, um, but uh, making the historical case that, you know, the U.S., made promises to the collapsing Soviet Union slash new Russia that it, NATO expansion wouldn't happen. And this, this was so controversial uh, and so uh, it, it made people hopping mad, basically. Uh, Schifferinson was actually chased off of Twitter after the Ukraine war started. Uh, people were so out of their minds angry. Schifferson, uh, by the way, is now at the University of Maryland Center for International and Security Studies. Yeah. Just yeah, in case that right. anyone's yes. interested. Um, <laughs> so just basically saying the U.S. should be doing less. I mean, the, the our motto back then was uh, realism and restraint. And that was a minority view that was very difficult to find people advocating for. Now it's very common. It's still a minority view, but it, I mean, we have people in power who are advocating for it. And I know that there is an effort to get people who are in favor of realism restraint uh, to be appointed by Trump in, you know, all, all levels of the 
executive branch. Whether that plays out, and of course, there's going to be a mix. I'm unsure what to think of Marco Rubio. Some people say he have told me that he has actually become less hawkish. I've not paid much attention to him <laughs> since 2016 uh, when he uh, dropped out of the race. He, to me, has not been on my radar a ton. That'd be good. He's hawkish on Iran. Lots of, I mean, that's going to be there. But compared to before, to not be hawkish on Ukraine and Russia and be hawkish on Iran is an improvement from being hawkish on everything. Yes, I agree. And, um, uh, yeah, so it to me, this is a dream come true, really. I mean, we're not anywhere close to the job being done, the job's barely starting <laughs> to be done. But to me, it's we've made enormous progress where it's not just a fringe view to be advocating for realism and restraint, as, as it, we might put it. Yeah, I think sometimes it's helpful to remind the black pillars uh, just how, how much worse things were <laughs> in not too long ago. And for us older guys who remember times like 2003, 2004, really all the way up until the end of the Bush administration, uh, because remember, Obama won a big victory in 2008 on promises to end the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war, none of which he did, of course. Uh, because he's a horrible, horrible person, and I'm not—I don't—I'm not exaggerating. Like truly loathsome, swamp creature Obama was, but he absolutely ran on this idea of scaling back military intervention. Uh, it seems every president does that, right? Uh, Bush ran in 2000 on uh, humble foreign policy and that sort of thing, but 9/11, of course, massively set back the cause of non-intervention because the state was ready. The state was ready to turn it into massive justification for surveillance state, for the Patriot Act, for Department of Homeland Security, all of this, which all of they had drafted and ready to go in legislation. They were just waiting for a good reason to do it. And you couldn't say anything against a uh, constant war everywhere in 2004, 2005. You were literally told to your face that you hated America. Uh, the Bush administration literally said, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. So it's good to keep that sort of thing in mind. Of course, I guess nowadays, if you say anything against uh, the usual foreign policy, you're either, with, you're, you're either with Biden or you're with Putin. I guess that's the current version of that. But at least half the country regards that as absurd. Whereas in 2004, those of us who were against constant intervention were a teeny tiny minority. Uh, so, yes, I agree. Uh, also, the rally around the flag effect doesn't seem to work nearly as well as it used to. All you had to do, it seemed that presidents for 30, 40 years, if not longer after 1945, all you had to do was claim that some foreign power had insulted you in some way and <laughs> Americans would rally around the idea of starting a new war. Some Americans still do that, usually old guys, uh, but people have largely grown very, very tired of that nonsense. Uh, so yeah, definitely um, progress has been made. So I guess the question is, okay, how much, <laughs> how much will this actually materialize in terms of any sort of actual scaling back? Because I guess there's two phases here. There's the phase where you just stop starting new wars constantly. And I do think that any attempt to actually send American troops to invade a foreign country would be met with a lot of resistance, uh, whereas you could get away with that in 2003, um, even to a country that had nothing to do with 9-11, i.e. Iraq, yet sent hundreds of thousands of American troops uh, to go there, thousands of which died. Uh, how many Americans are willing to sign up and go get killed for Ukraine or even Taiwan? I don't know, but it's going to take a whole lot more propaganda than they've got going so far to get people to sign off on that. So that's that's phase one where you just stop starting new wars or sending Americans to go die places. I guess phase two uh, would be actually withdrawing from some places. And it doesn't appear that we've reached that phase <laughs> at all yet. Uh, and I agree with you. I think maybe the first place we would actually see that happen would be in Ukraine, where maybe the U.S. would actually become 
anti-interventionist or, you know, it, quietly just sort of withdraw from that, less and, have less and less of a footprint in Ukraine over time. They're certainly not going to make any big announcements about how, yep, you know, Russia can do whatever it wants now. Uh, but I could see just sort of a quiet, silent withdrawal from that arena. Uh, but I just don't, I don't know what the odds are on that. I think the, the big question, right, is on Iran. But, I mean, Trump, I would describe Trump as an Iran hawk during his term, his first term. But even that materialized in terms of some drone attacks and assassinations and things like that. I mean, it's all dishonest and acts of war, but it seemed orchestrated to avoid any sort of U.S. invasion of Iran or to provoke that sort of thing. Yeah. On, uh, on a, well, we'll get to Iran in the Middle East, but I just want to note uh, uh, Trump was interviewed on, um, I don't remember his first name, so something Bet David, a, a popular podcaster I'm not familiar with until this election. Uh, he, Trump flat out said, we don't want regime change and can't get involved in that in, uh, in Iran. That's not saying, yeah, we're packing up and leaving the Middle East, but compared to where things were before, Huge improvement, crazy. This is woohoo. Pra you know, we have to see what happens, but you know, get the champagne. <laughs> well, we were uh, talking about regime change in Russia just oh, a oh, few years yeah. ago, which of course it's, was just crazy talk. It's still, yeah, it's it's madness. But so let, let's go. Let's start with um, <laughs> speaking of Russia. Yeah, let's yeah, talk about Europe Ukraine and Ukraine because we're, we're going to talk about the three <laughs> theaters, as it were. Well, this case, so there was an, an escalation in Ukraine. Yes. Now, this is Biden administration stuff uh, where, I mean, what's going on there? Now, I, I wrote a short article for Mises.org for uh, Powered Market on this. And I started with the sentence, the people who run the Biden administration mm -hmm. yes. uh, escalated in that theater recently, right? Because I don't know, does Biden know what's going on? I have a hard time believing Biden handed down orders saying, yes, uh, tell Ukraine to start using long range missiles on Russia. I mean, it's possible, but he doesn't seem on that level of engaged. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, technically, wasn't he in Brazil when this decision was made? Yeah, he was in the rainforest. In the jungle. Uh, but uh, yeah. So, what do you think is so going on there? The. I. I cannot view it any other way as than a middle finger to Trump by, you're exactly right, whoever is running things in the administration uh, to allow. So we've, we've given Ukraine these long range missiles, ATACMs. I don't remember what that stands for. I think the range is about 250 miles, if I'm not mistaken. It's around 200 for sure, because, yeah, I looked that up yesterday. And um, they, the, so there's several several layers here we have to talk about. So one, the first rule until now was Ukraine cannot use them outside of Ukraine's pre-2014 borders against Russia. So they couldn't strike Russia, Russia. Uh, that, that is what was lifted, that ban. They were allowed to use them in Kursk Oblast, where they have their offensive that, in my view, has been a disaster. Now, and so that rule was lifted, and Ukraine, excuse me, it's, it seems they launched six of these missiles. And Russia says five were shot down, who knows how many. But the point is, is that it was viewed as a big escalation, and there's two more layers then. The next layer is the technical aspect of these missiles I'm not, you know, super familiar with, but apparently the targeting needs to be done by basically U.S. technicians. <laughs> and this is not a crazy conspiratorial thing to say. One, people have been saying this openly, like, well, you know, we're probably providing targeting, et cetera, et cetera. But as we talked about many months ago, I can't even remember if it was this year or last year, there was that leaked call from uh, the German high military officials uh, who were in Singapore and they were using an unsecured line and we have the transcript of the leaked call and they are discussing that this is a problem with them providing whatever their equivalent missiles are <laughs> to Ukraine. One, they're like, we can't give them enough to do really anything at all. <laughs> Two, 
someone has to basically input the targeting data that can't and it not the Ukrainians. And so the the call was sort of scandalous in part because like, well, maybe we can have this military contractor do it. Or since the French and the Americans are already in Ukraine, maybe they can do it for us. So that's the second layer of why this is escalatory. And then there's the third layer is that Russia is aware of this. And several weeks ago, or maybe months ago now, everything's just blurred together. Putin said that, you know, an attack on Russia with these missiles, basically, uh, by basically by a, a non-nuclear power backed by a nuclear power would be considered basically an act of war by NATO. So Trump laid that line out real clear, and the Putin U.S. Putin laid just, that line out. Oh, I'm sorry, Putin. Yeah, Putin, not Trump. Not Trump. <laughs> Putin laid that line out real clear, and in response to Trump winning, whoever in the administration just waltzed right over it. And I'm maybe they're thinking this is a great way to box Trump in. It's like we escalate the conflict, and it'll be harder for Trump to, to get out of it. Now, so that's concerning. I don't think World War III is about to pop off. Um, it's a risk. <laughs> I think the betting odds were up to like 18% that a nuclear device would go off this year or something. I That's a pretty I, vague event, though, a nuclear yeah. device going off. I mean, I, uh, that could be interpreted in a number of ways. I don't... I'm not worried about that. I mean, it's... It's a possibility. We don't want to just keep escalating. But partially because I, it was very clear that Putin was happy Trump won. Uh, and polling shows like Russia was like the only country in Europe where <laughs> the vast majority of the population said they would have voted for Trump. Um, so I am hoping that Putin will be like, okay, we've got you know, to January 20th, new administration coming in. Let's not, you know, just burn all the bridges down, as it were. I mean, not that there's many <laughs> bridges left standing, but I'm hoping that'll lead to some restraint. It seems Russia's going to retaliate uh, as a sort of deterrence maintenance thing. What that will take the form of, who knows? The U.S. just shut its embassy down in Kiev because they're like, uh, <laughs> there's an aerial attack that might happen. And right. I just saw on Twitter, which, you know, Twitter rumor, who knows, that they might actually use, there's t speculation that, tr that Russia might launch a missile capable of carrying a nuclear warhead, but will not have a nuclear warhead on it to attack Kiev. And it's not going to be very accurate. It's going to be, you know a big payload with a big, wide, you know, it's with nuclear weapons, you don't need to be pinpoint accurate. So I don't know if that's going to happen or not. Uh, as, of, as of the recording, that was that speculation that's happening. All right. But they're so going to do say, something. Well, let's say Ru the, Rus the Russians are right. And uh, Trump is the less belligerent party uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of who was running for presidency in the United States. Uh, it's it's easy to see why any reasonable person in Russia would want Trump to win, uh, because he just seems less obsessed with the Russians the way that uh, Kamala Kamala's people, at least. I mean, yeah. she probably doesn't know what Russia is, uh, but at least her people I mean, are pretty obsessed. She's palling around with Liz Cheney, who might have been. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Defense, yeah, I want to so. talk about Liz Cheney, maybe. Maybe maybe next time we could do that. Just to, this, yeah. She's now become the world's most useless politician, like, has no purpose anymore. But so, so let's say, so, okay, so Trump's the less, um, uh, the less belligerent guy. So what, what should he do as soon as he comes into office in January? What, so he's a reasonable guy. What do you think he could get away with doing in Washington just as his first steps to really uh, try and avoid any further escalations here? Yeah, I mean, that, that's where it's going to be difficult. Um, for On the one hand, I doubt he's going to be pushing for you know, big arms packages in Congress. 
I don't know what the bureaucracy is going to do in terms of continuing to ship things off to Ukraine. I mean, all of the talk, it's, I mean, it's all funny money in terms of fake, fake accounting of like, oh, we valued this Humvee at X amount of dollars. Actually, we were wrong. It's, you know, negative X dollars. So we can ship more stuff to Ukraine. Um, so they could play tricks like that. In a way, this escalation could potentially be beneficial when Trump comes to office in that it really serves to remind him how the military bureaucracy screwed him over in his first term. Great example is Syria, where he's like, explicitly, get out of Syria, let's go. And they stonewalled him and lied to him and they openly acknowledged this. So this is a reminder of you know, his enemies, as it were. And his son, Don Jr., has been pleasantly uh, had good takes on Twitter, and he flat out, you know, said, this is a move to box my father in. Um, so, uh, and I can't, I've seen other people affiliated with the transition and all that complaining about it. So hopefully, you know, that'd be good if it really reminds Trump, you know, these people can't be trusted. Um, on the other hand, I don't think Trump wants, and I actually think it would be bad for the cause of reorienting American foreign policy, if there is a just complete and total Ukrainian collapse. Uh, I'm glad we left Afghanistan. I think that had to happen, as however messy it would be, but I don't think it had to be as messy as it was, and I think that that... Uh, at the time, I speculated that the military purposefully uh, made a hash of it because they didn't want to go. So like, well, we're going to make this as messy as possible. And they did. And there were Afghan people, you know, falling out of airplanes. All you know, it was it was madness. It was a ca craziness. So it would be great if Trump could be like, all right, turning off the spigot of aid, which without which Ukraine cannot hold on much longer. Europe is a joke. They cannot replace the aid, even if they wanted to. Notably, the, the, the German government collapsed right after the U.S. election. So Schultz and I forget whatever party he is. It's been governing Germany forever. Uh, called Putin. Uh, this is the first time since, uh, since the war started. And some speculate he called Putin to be like, <laughs> yeah, so the U.S. is going to give the okay for these missiles in Kursk. We're, we're not on board with that. Don't get mad at us. <laughs> That's one speculation. But it, there no European militaries. I mean, the, I, I've been writing about since, since, you know, the middle of last year, how we're out of the cupboard is bare, to quote, you know, NATO officials themselves. We don't have much more to send to Ukraine. Europe especially, because they've just, you know, been free riding on the U.S. since the 90s. So one might hope that Trump could then organize a deal where Ukraine would de jure acknowledge the annexation of the four oblasts that Russia has claimed. And in my view, I cannot see... I, of course, can be totally wrong. The future is radically uncertain. In my view, I have a hard time envisioning Putin ending the war without control of the four oblasts that have been officially annexed into the Russian Federation. I, I have a hard time seeing that happening. Anything is possible. But I think that's going to be the minimum goal. Uh, tr Russia is winning. So if Russia doesn't like the deal, they can just keep pushing on and gamble as to whether the U.S. I mean, the U.S. will just have to keep being more and more and more involved to stop Ukraine from losing. So he could gamble that the U.S. won't do that. Then we're, I'm starting to get scared, you know. Um, it seems that what Trump should do, right, is come in, give Ukraine a chance to save some face by keeping Odessa and some coastline. And hey, let all this other stuff go. I mean, these were like 40%, 50% Russian ethnics anyway. 
in a lot of these areas. I mean, those are the only areas that Russia could ever hope to keep anyway, really, in practical terms, is if there's not like – if there's a significant Russian population there already. These are, of course, what's, re what's totally never mentioned anymore is that Ukraine started this war on eastern Ukraine. They were shelling cities in eastern Ukraine before the Russian state became directly involved. They had started, the, the Kiev started a, uh, a civil war, essentially, against Russian separatists in the east. And then that gave Russia the ability to come in and say, hey, we're defending our countrymen. Essentially, it's the same playbook as in Georgia and a couple of other places. As yes, well. yes. It, and Ukraine has just ramped up the anti-Russian domestic laws uh, dealing with the, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church that's affiliated with the Moscow Patriarchy. I think it's been straight up outlawed now, um, banning Russian language, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the real question is, is who will be in charge of the Ukrainian government? Uh, because there's the hardline nationalists from eastern Ukraine I aren't going to want to give up anything. And it's not, I mean, these, these are the neo-Nazi people. It's not <laughs> crazy to think, you know, they might drag Zelensky out behind the shed and shoot him and be like, there's a new government in charge, not this corrupt puppet who was secretly colluding with Russia, or whatever they'd say. And um, I mean, of course, because Ukraine is so corrupt, it's it's the perfect excuse because you can say Zelensky was corrupt and profiting from the war. And, you know, that's why he had to be removed. So it's not out of the question that that could happen. That I see as being the biggest potential hurdle is what what's possible domestically in Ukraine, which, by the way, I believe for the first time, I just saw a poll out this week, I think, or the past few days, that now a slight majority of Ukrainians want to cut a deal. It's like 52% this poll found. Uh, that, so people are recognizing the writing on the wall, as it were. Well, it's um, or, yeah. there's a lot of scholarship on this, uh, even some like quantitative stuff, which just looks at the number of conflicts and their outcomes and all that stuff. And... Uh, it notes that virtually all conflicts, uh, certainly in, in the 19th century and for centuries before that, in the West especially, uh, but even in conflicts in the 20th century that weren't major conflicts like World War II and stuff like that, these conflicts end with negotiated settlements. I mean, this is how virtually all wars end, with negotiated settlements, not, not this unconditional surrender stuff that, uh, that moralistic Americans become obsessed with that whoever the U.S. is fighting must be completely destro destroyed. Of course, the U.S. hasn't actually succeeded in doing much of that uh, since 1945, but that seems to usually be the stated purpose. That's where regime change is, right? That's essentially unconditional surrender. But for people who actually care about ending bloodshed or bringing an end to wars, uh, figuring out a diplomatic solution, wars end with negotiated settlements. So it seems that Trump could actually help himself politically by coming in and saying, hey, I struck a deal. We ended the bloodshed in Ukraine. Ukraine still exists. Ukraine has a port on the Black Sea. Uh, and the Russians uh, were able to get these territories. Yeah, that wasn't ideal. But that's all That's all in these this mists of, a, of an internal conflict that began years ago. And... Let's not forget that Kiev was was fighting these people before Russia invaded. He could really start to paint a picture of the complexity of it. But in the end, I ended the conflict and Ukraine has sovereignty again. Yay me. And then Putin can go back and say, hey, look, we now have all the coastline of the Sea of Azov. We have water for uh, Crimea. We have a land bridge to Crimea. And then we helped out our Russian speaking patriots in eastern Ukraine. And then that's it. I mean... That's <laughs> that's all that needs to happen, and and of course, I mean, it would be nonsense to, to spare me any nonsense about Ukrainian democracy because that was, <laughs> of course, uh, this is a, a a country that has suspended all elections. Might I remind you, by the way, the United States had an election in the midst of its civil war, but yes. Ukrainians tell us that, no, you can't have any sort of election when we're at war, which only in Ukraine, which, of course, couldn't care less about freedom or democracy because they outlaw free speech they outlaw freedom of religion this is what americans are supposed to be dying for no thanks so yeah just end the conflict 
But yeah, I agree. Probably better to let the Ukrainians save some face on this rather than have just like a total collapse because I think that would just make NATO more paranoid and crazed. And I don't know what the Poles would do in response to that. Um, yeah. Especially if Russians, I guess, started occupying Western Ukraine, that would that would make Poland go. Yeah, I, I can't not. see that ever happening, <laughs> um, really. But that would be a long. That would be the the absolute extreme. Of, yeah, of I mean, victory. to me, yeah. uh, the word. I mean, I. Yeah, there's various degrees of Russian victory. Uh, I think if the U.S. does not get involved. I, I mean, and it's just <laughs> the Ukrainian military collapses. It would not be out of the question, I think, for Russia to impose a puppet government on what's left of Ukraine. Under a deal with Trump, I, I doubt that there'd be a puppet government uh, in what's left of Ukraine. And it's just the longer the war goes on, the more doomed Ukraine is. Uh, it already had horrible demographics. Those have plunged into the basement. Who knows how many people have been killed? Who knows how many millions have left the country and will never return because it's a bombed out ruin? I mean, given the state of budgets and the economy, it's hard to imagine anyone wanting to pour in the hundreds of billions of dollars needed to rebuild Ukraine. And... Uh, it's just, it does not have a bright future, really, no matter what happens. So the, the quicker the war ends, the better it will be for the continued existence of Ukraine. And, as a uh, people. Yes, I, as, I mean, as a yeah. nation state, yes. And in a way, it, I mean, I'm not sure how smart the Ukrainian nationalists are, meaning the, the neo-Nazis is what I, what I mean, the uber-nationalist neo-Nazi types. But... I think they should realize, you know, uh, discretion is the better part of valor at times. This actually will greatly aid their Ukrainian state building project because the whole conflict is a result of <laughs> Ukraine not having exactly a unified identity. Uh, going back for various historical reasons, uh, you know, what is now. East, uh, uh, Western Ukraine was uh, uh, part of Poland for a very long time. It only became part of Ukraine, really, when <laughs> uh, the Soviet Union split Poland with Germany, as we've talked about before. Um, but it, it really has solidified a Ukrainian identity. They will probably continue to be a very powerful force in Ukrainian politics. They can root out the Russian language and <laughs> the, uh, the church and all that sort of stuff. That'd be if they're thinking long term, you know, and they can tell themselves, oh, we will reclaim the Donbass one day. Um, but <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, really, it's a difficult situation for Ukrainians and Ukrainian leadership especially. But... Yeah, hopefully Trump can navigate this and, I mean, cutting off the West, the U.S. has a lot of leverage over Ukraine. They're not going to, they can't keep the war up without us. So in a way, it, they can continue fighting, you know, to the end of time if they want, just without us. Uh, so, you know. People are like, Ukraine's a sovereign country. They can make these decisions. It's like, yeah, but we're subsidizing the whole war. So, sure, they cannot listen to us, but we cannot, you know, keep giving them gajillions of dollars. Well, let's talk about the Middle East now. And uh, I foresee that is a far less dynamic situation in terms of U.S. Uh, involvement and policy. Uh, it's actually really difficult to see what Trump would do differently from the current administration. I mean, obviously, right, he's gotten tons of money from uh, pro-Israel individuals and organizations, certainly has not expressed 
any misgivings about uh, giving tons of aid to the state of Israel. Although, I mean, the, the, the good news, the only good news in there is that he plays up the whole, hey, I'm going to strike a deal and we're going to end the conflict somehow. Okay, but does ending the conflict mean in the, the total ethnic cleansing of the West Bank and Gaza? Uh, because we're we're even moving. It's clear the state of Israel is trying to use the situation to cleanse ethnically, not just Gaza, but the West Bank as well. A lot more intervention from Tel Aviv going on there. So in southern Lebanon, right? I mean, this is a spreading conflict. So what does victory look like for Trump there? What what sort of deal does he want? Is And was there anything different from what the Biden administration is doing? Yeah, well, I mean, the Biden administration is just flailing around like a chicken with its head cut off. Uh, and and not just flailing around, but failing. I mean, the, the Houthi, I mean, really, they're the de facto government of a big chunk of Yemen, has, you know, now basically control of the Red Sea. Despite all the U.S. efforts, I forget, I think we've spent a few billion bucks now bombing uh Yemen, it's not done anything. I mean, and let's remind everyone, Saudi Arabia was bombing Yemen for like eight or nine years. I, I don't even know at this point. They've been bombing Yemen for ages. And the Houthis are still there. And they're still there after we've given it a try. So sh short of some sort of very costly punitive expedition <laughs> where you send in, you know, a Marine Corps division or something to, you know, get bogged down in another intractable war. I mean, that's how things are. Fortunately, not much U.S. shipping goes through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. So if it's an intolerable situation, maybe other countries can deal with it, which it just a, a, the state of, of European militaries. There was, I, if I'm not mistaken, there was like a German frigate or something in, in the Pacific and it returned uh, not through, it, it returned going back down around South Africa. It did not go through the Red Sea. This is, I mean, we're at this, you know, European navies are like, we don't want to risk going through the Red Sea. This is, I mean, embarrassing. That It's wild. But uh, it's not the America's problem. So it, the Really, it, it'd be hard for Trump to do worse unless he escalates and starts sending troops in or something. So uh, there was talk in the American Conservative magazine a few weeks before the election. There was a report that Israeli government officials were a bit perturbed at Trump winning because they worried that he would sort of force them to negotiate an end to the conflict before they can accomplish everything they want to accomplish, which short of, yeah, trying to somehow get the Gazans to leave, it's not really clear what they're trying to accomplish. They're just flailing around with U.S. support. And this is something Mearsheimer has pointed out, that in contrast to previous Israeli wars, Israel today is extremely dependent on U.S. support and aid. Uh, they were able to wage, you know, sort of rather rapid crushing victories and also a defeat. Uh, but without the U.S. basically, you know, having to, you know, be, without it being a crisis of, you know, a disaster if the U.S. was not, you know, uh, being the sugar daddy, as it were. Um, so it's possible Trump, as you said, could be, we got to cut a deal, we got to end this. There's already talk that Hezbollah and Iran are like, okay, yeah, we'll cut a ceasefire in Lebanon. We have to see how that plays out. We have to see what happens with Iran. There are a lot of Iran hawks, uh, even people who I think are surprisingly pretty good, like Pete, Pete Hegseth, I'm actually pleasantly surprised with. Uh, when he was first, when he was announced on Twitter, <laughs> I thought, like, is this a joke, like a parody of because it's like, you know, Trump is always watching Fox and Friends and stuff. And I was like, wow, that's wild. But then it was pointed out that Hegseth is on the record supporting uh, Defend the Guard which is, to me, wild. I, I, <laughs> someone nominated to be Secretary of Defense who supports Defend the Guard, which, for those who aren't familiar, basically would prevent the feds from calling up and deploying the National Guard to combat zones without 
an actual declaration of war. So the, the National Guard, if this had been in place, wouldn't have been deployed in any war since World War II. Um, anyway, he, he's hawkish on Iran, though. But, um, and we'll have to talk, come back again to him for China. Uh, but I don't, I mean, Trump's comments, uh, Trump seems to recognize we can't fight a war right now. It'd be disastrous. No one wants it. We're broke. So I don't think he's going to return to be like at maximum pressure on Iran. We're going to break them and institute regime change. As we just said, he's on the record of not wanting to do that. Um, the U.S. forces are scheduled to leave Iraq, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, under the current agreement. But that keeps getting extended and stuff. But it'd be nice if we got out of there. Uh, Trump would be foolish, in my opinion, to not ensure we leave Syria after he was defied openly in wanting to do that last time. So really scaling back to, you know, perspective and marginal improvements. If we leave Af Iraq and we leave Syria, big improvements that should be celebrated, even though it's not, we've not, you know, fixed the situation by any means tangible, valuable progress. Well, in one piece of good news that is beyond Trump's control, really, uh, and doesn't have anything to do with our election, is the fact that the Saudis don't seem to be applying maximum pressure anymore against the Iranians. Uh, because, of course, the Saudis and the Iranians are traditional enemies, really, for control over the Persian Gulf. And in recent years, the Saudis, there seems to be some, some detente there between the Saudis and, and the Iranians. And that, that seems to be bad for, well, they, they reopened, they reestablished relations between the two countries, which had been in terrible shape for a long, long time. And it just looks like there's less pressure coming down from the Saudis to box in the Iranians, which looks to me like it's been Saudi policy for a long time. And that was one thing that allied the Saudis with the state of Israel too, right? Was that they both are uh, against Iran, but it seems that there's now less Saudi opposition to Iran. That's not good for Israel. Uh, it's good for us, though, because now there are, there's one less place that's applying a lot of pressure on the American regime to uh, fight Iran about. Um, I don't know how big that change is, but there's certainly been some evidence of a change there. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what to think. Saudi Arabia has really been pushing for the U.S. to extend an official security guarantee be terrible ridiculous yes don't do it um <laughs> well i mean the, that's always been kind of implied since the 70s was a security guarantee but i guess now they want more explicit yeah they want uh, which yeah, is explicit. yeah which i agree horrible idea and i will note that the head of the saudi arabian sovereign wealth fund i believe uh <laughs> is was at the uh, UFC fight with Trump. Uh, there's a picture of him like sitting right next to Trump. So <laughs> we have to see what happens. You know, uh, Jared Kushner will not be around, is my understanding. He engineered that Abrams Accord thing. It seems that the Arab world is, well, before the current goings on, was softening on Israel. Even to some extent, they still are Jordan shot down missiles, Iranian missiles in the first Iranian missile attack on Israel. But the situation in Gaza and the West Bank is, of course, a thorn in their side, although it doesn't seem that any of the Arabian governments like the Palestinians, really. Uh, well, that's more of an issue with elites versus the population, yes, right? Yes, so the, exactly. the bloodshed in Gaza and West Bank is bad for the the normal people, the ordinary people in all of these Arab countries hate that. The elites, I don't think, care. Right. So I guess it's a question of how much pressure can normal people put on the elites in these countries. In some countries, some. In other countries that are, you know, they're military dictatorships, such as, I mean, Saudi Arabia obviously couldn't care less about what regular people think. Uh, so I mean, that could take a long time to filter upward. So who knows what the time frame is on right. that. Yeah. And... Um... So, yeah, it's room for improvement that I think is possible. Maybe a good way to phrase, <laughs> phrase the Middle East. 
But yes, uh, I think the, the lesson here is don't, don't expect any major changes in uh, course on the Middle East at all, although there are changes going on. but I mean, and, and part of it, actually, which will lead, segue to the next theater, part of it will depend on what happens in East Asia. Because as we did an episode ago, uh, one or two months ago, you know, we have no, uh, uh, I don't know if we do now, but we, for a period of time at least, we had no aircraft carriers in East Asia because we were rerouting everything that could float to the Middle East uh, because of tension with Iran and Hezbollah, Israel, yada, 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 yada. So it really depends on, on if Trump actually <laughs> will implement the long talked about but obviously not happening pivot to Asia. And um, so, yeah, let's talk about that. So obviously no, uh, <laughs> no significant pivot to Asia that I can see, although certainly no lack of talk about China and Trump wanting to pursue further um, trade war elements with the Chinese regime there. Uh, they don't really state in any sort of explicit way in fact that what's really behind this is that yeah the u.s wants to maintain or grow global hegemony they want to impose at least some level of american power in east asia and the u.s has uh china boxed in in a variety of ways right the u.s has been expanding its alliance um activity with the philippines recently and of course the u.s is a long-term ally with japan and South Korea, and then unofficially in a more vague capacity with Taiwan. So you don't hear much really in terms of explicit talk about Taiwan or guarantees of defense for Taiwan and that sort of thing. But it's the posture, the general posture of this administration is anti-China. But I'm not quite sure beyond a bunch of talks about trade. And who knows how much of that is even performative? I don't even – who knows what he's telling Xi behind the scenes about what relations – what Trump envisions relations are between the U.S. and China. So it seems there's a general anti-Beijing posture, but uh, it's, it's unclear. Very little has been being clearly said about how that is going to look over the next four years. Yeah, I will, if I am not mistaken uh... – in 20, well, 2017, I guess, or maybe it was 2016. It was either, it was either in the transition period or shortly after he came to office. Trump took a phone call from, I believe, the, the former president of, or pro, I think president, I can't even remember now in Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen, I believe her name was. Uh, Trump took her call, which has not happened, I don't know, since Reagan or something. Um, so that was noteworthy. Um, a lot will depend, I mean, a, a staffing, my understanding of the staffing process right now, I guess, is that they're starting at the top, you know, and then they staff their way down. One thing to look out for is where, if El, Elbridge Colby, where he ends up. He was in the first Trump admin, and he is, more, uh, he wants more of a forward posture in Asia than I would like. But he is very on the record. He does not want war with China. That, and that basically he wants to support Taiwan a lot. He wants the U.S. to be involved in East Asia. But he does not want, you know, saber rattling. Let's, you know, we'll nuke China if they invade Iran. or I mean, or Taiwan or anything like that. He is an immense proponent of the pivot to East Asia. So we have to see what he does. If he ends up in the administration, which I would bet money he will in some deputy secretary position. Similarly, to circle back to Pete Hegseth, he is also he's on video saying basically that the US would lose a war with China. That is uh, paradoxically encouraging to hear someone say that <laughs> uh, because it, you know, with the Ukraine situation, there's this just delusional thinking of like material 
factors don't matter. <laughs> you know, we, we constantly reference Mises' uh, uh, 1918 paper on war financing. You know, war can only be waged with present goods. It seems that, you know, the, the idea of scarcity, as we've harped on also, the, uh, you know, uh, our official strategy is that nothing is beyond U.S. capabilities, you know obviously conflicts with reality. So to have a Secretary of Defense who recognizes that reality, huge marginal improvement. By no means does that mean the work is done. But that is encouraging to hear because it, it also, you know, hopefully that recognition would lead to favoring a de-escalatory policy in, with regards to China. If you recognize, gee, if we start an honest-to-goodness war over Taiwan, we might lose. If you understand that, then you will approach the situation much more in tune with reality and aware of the risks. Yeah, and those guys are just talking in terms of a tactical loss, I think, too, right? They're, they're, they're talking about losing militarily. Uh, when you look at the larger strategic picture, right, what does that do to the U.S. economy? Oh, it'd be... Uh, right? It's just devastating. And, I mean, talking about this whole, like, coming to reality thing, uh, I sent you, right, a while back, this this short quote from Mearsheimer. I think it was, this was Taiwanese TV, I guess? Uh, no, he was in China, I think. Oh, he was in China, okay. He just and got back from China. He, uh, he was being interviewed, and so here's what he says. Uh, he's, now, I've, of course, criticized Mearsheimer. I like him, but uh, he's been too much of a China hawk historically for me. Uh, and he's a different type of realist for me, so he's not quite the anti-interventionist I prefer. But, of course, we quote him a lot because he's an insightful guy and not insane, and uh, is certainly I'd rather have him in charge of American foreign policy than pretty much everybody who actually is. So, but he said he's he, he he signals a change in mind. I think on China a little bit recently, when he says in this interview, the U.S. cannot do much at this point to slow down Chinese economic growth, uh, and he says he would bet that the Chinese will overcome the American effort to damage the Chinese economy more than the American economy is damaged as a result of these sanctions and tariffs. What he's saying is is basically that his. His efforts, he's talked a lot about containing China, and now he's expressing doubts that the U.S. can really keep that up, that the U.S., as one person put it, and I don't think these are Mearsheimer's words, that the U.S. has kind of passed the point of no return on containing China, that is, in using trade policy to try and bring China under control, to put China under America's thumb economically, he's doubtful that that's really possible. And, of course, you have to remember that uh, there's a whole big world out there, and the U.S. Uh, d damaging Chinese trade relations with the U.S., that... that that doesn't necessarily do much to destroy the Chinese economy because there are other markets out there. And we can see how the Chinese have been pursuing other markets, right? They get 90% or 90% of Iran's oil goes to China, which also shows how delusional some recent comments have been about how um, Trump is going to impose more sanctions on Iranian <laughs> oil. Okay, well, 90% of it goes to China, so good luck with that. And, yeah. of course, the, the bonds between China and Russia have been really, really growing. So the question is, okay, how much can the U.S. really hurt China? And I guess the whole point of it is hurt China more than the U.S. economy is hurt by these trade wars. And Mearsheimer now seems doubtful about that, even though this is a person who's perfectly happy about containing China and the prospect of doing so if it could be done. So I, I see that as a pretty big warning to people who maybe going forward continue to live in this world where they think that the U.S. has some sort of trump card against China and its economy. Maybe it doesn't have one after all, and that maybe uh, happy and more pleasant relations would be better strategy going forward with China. Yeah, I'm not... I am not sure to how, what extent he's referencing just economic containment. Um, I mean, it, sometimes with Mearsheimer, it's difficult to know when he is pronosticating as to the, this is what will happen because of the structure of the international system and this is what should be done. <laughs> uh, and sometimes it's hard to tell with 
China, but he, I believe he would still say the U.S. will work to balance against China's rise. Um, I do, I, personally, I don't know what to think of the future of the Chinese economy. It's, you know, riven with <laughs> government uh, planning and all sorts of bad things. And even when it comes to their technical abilities, I have heard very contrasting things in terms of what they're actually able to do. But um, I do think it's we can, can have a ba ba policy of balancing against China that does not result in war. Uh, and to me, the best way to do that, as I advocated way back when in my paper on U.S.-Taiwan strategy, is to lead from behind. So far behind, we're on the other side of the planet. Let Japan... Let India, let these huge wealthy countries that have an interest in not being dominated by China do the heavy work. And uh, really, I suppose it comes down to an academic question, one might say, between offensive and defensive realism as to uh, what, uh, what China will accept. Mearsheimer always said, I mean, he's told this story so many times about, <laughs> and he, he, very amusingly, because he just came back from China, where he was like, I tell the Chinese, you know, if I was their national security advisor, I'd do X, Y, and Z, <laughs> you know, and that's push the U.S. beyond the second island chain. Well, I don't think China, as we've talked about before, China is domestically unstable. And... It's not going to be easy or cheap to do that. So if China can accept sort of a status quo of Taiwan is only um, de facto independent, I mean, were Taiwan to declare independence, you know, head for the bunkers. But uh, if China can accept that, if there can be some sort of uh, rapprochement between the U.S. and China in terms of we are competing, but we're not deadly enemies, some sort of shift in the vibe, one might say. I can really see things going well. What would really be great, but is unlikely to happen, uh, I mean, really, this, this is like the somehow achieving, you know, 105% on the test. <laughs> If it, and I don't think, I mean, just it's just if anyone could do it, Trump maybe could do it. I don't think he can, though. But if he could really rebuild relations with Russia and pull Russia away from China. I do think if we look to the future, there will be many books written, many dissertations on the bizarro world of Russia and China being aligned together and the disasters, the foolish mistakes, the madness that engulfed U.S. policymakers to lead to the current situation. Because it is not, <laughs> it is not a natural state of affairs. It is bizarre that Russia and China are growing closer. And if Russia were to be pulled away from China, well, that really threatens China's ability to engage in rampant military expansion were it to want to, which I don't think it's necessarily eager to do. It is expanding its blue water navy, but you could also say it's doing that because of the U U.S. threatening it. Um, but I mean, the, the China is, as you said, dependent on a lot of Iranian oil, et cetera, et cetera. They're the Strait of Malacca, uh, sort of in Malaysia area, is where, you know, a huge percentage of imports to China go through. And it would not be difficult for India and the U.S. or whoever to, you know, instantly shut that off. And then China's in trouble. Oh, look, here's this giant Eurasian-spanning minor great power with lots of oil and natural gas. Uh, they could make it, potentially. Um, so that's, that's sort of like the bonus points. It'd be great if that could happen. I think it would lead to a de-escalation of affairs in East Asia 
that might be something for you know the president in ten or twenty years to try doing. But <laughs> yes, it would require. I think for it to happen faster, it would require a significant amount of American uh, public pol- public opinion to change. Um, now that could be accelerated by significant changes in American uh, economic prospects. Right. If if there's one thing I've witnessed more than once, it's that when your uh, domestic economic situation turns very dire, the population loses a whole lot of interest in foreign wars. Yes. Uh, for now, the regime gets interested in foreign wars because they see this as a way to burnish their popularity or to prop up their their own regime and so on. But the uh, the population uh, in general, normal people, lose a whole lot of interest in the the glories of foreign intervention. Uh, when they're having trouble paying for their groceries. And I see, I think you see a little bit of that now. But if the economy got significantly worse, we get into the middle of a big, uh, big recession right now. I don't know how bad the next recession is going to be. Uh, who knows? Uh, that would affect it. But I think you would need a larger overall decline, I think, to really change and motivate a, a real and, turn. And on, uh, on that subject, I've not had a chance to read it. It's I think several hundred pages, but I've seen excerpts from it. The uh, the annual U.S.-China Economic and Security of Review Commission annual report came out. And um, some noteworthy things I've seen people have pulled from it. One, it says we might lose a war with China. So that's an encouraging sign to, to recognize that. But then it has a uh, few key recommendations. And this is just interesting. I'm not exactly sure what my thoughts, well, I know what my thoughts are on the specific recommendation, but the number one recommendation is basically to uh, marshal all of the country's resources to build a machine god. I, I am not kidding. <laughs> the, the, the number one recommendation is to institute a Manhattan Project-like program to build AGI, Artificial General Intelligence which is an AI that's better at doing anything than a human is. So I definitely don't want the government to build a machine god. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly <laughs> what, if, how AI regulation should be done, if it should be done, but I don't think that's a great idea. But it is noteworthy that this is another aspect of China-US <laughs> competition is that the fear is China will develop AGI first, and we can't allow that. We have to develop it first. Well, just and, the latest demonstration that war is the health of the state. I mean, yeah. it will look what they can use it to justify. And it, it is. <laughs> I mean, part, part of me, I'm no computer scientist, but part of me is skeptical that an actual machine consciousness could be achieved some I, I, I don't know enough about it to really know, but that's just my I'm skeptical of how far AI could advance for various reasons. But I don't think the US government should devote, I don't know what percentage of the GDP went to the Manhattan Project, something like uh, should not do that to develop a machine God. So. Well, of course, I mean, uh, the first thing they would want to use the machine for would be central planning. So yes. central planning to own the communists. Great. Good good strategy. Thanks. Yes. That's yeah, that's how our regime thinks. Well, <laughs> well we're this, an hour in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we should probably cut it short this time. Uh so thank you, Zach, uh, for joining me. We'll know more next month as to what this administration has planned, but we, uh, of course, uh, I mean, really next summer is probably when we'll probably do in a retrospective about where things headed with this administration. But we'll see how much things, how much closer we are to uh, a nuclear exchange uh, for our December episode. <laughs> I don't know. Hopefully not, not any closer. But until then, thank you all for listening to Radio Rothbard. Thank you, Zach, for joining me today. And we'll see you next time.